mean, there were real consequences and repercussions uh, for crossing the color line. And so you had to be very careful. I mean, it was dancing a fine line. Hello, and welcome to another edition of Lady Wrestler, the story behind the story. This podcast gives you an exclusive behind the scenes look at the documentary Lady Wrestler, the amazing untold story of African-American women in the ring. The documentary chronicles the accomplishments of Black women who broke racial and gender boundaries in the male-dominated wrestling business in the mid 20th century. I'm Chris Bournet and I directed the documentary. That voice that you heard at the beginning was Hassan Jeffries, acclaimed author and professor of African-American studies at The Ohio State University, my alma mater. In the clip from the Lady Wrestler documentary, Hassan describes the place in history that Black women wrestlers carved, or should I say clawed, in history. The Lady Wrestlers, as they were often referred to in their era in the 1950s and 60s, were unlikely and often unwitting civil rights pioneers. While they certainly supported the advancement of African Americans, the women didn't necessarily consider themselves activists. Many of the women were wives and mothers and were simply trying to provide a decent living for their families. The women entered a field that was dominated by powerful white men at a time when many women were not even working outside the home. To give you an idea of how much ahead of their time these trailblazing women were, here are a few eye-opening facts from the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics. In 1950, only about one in three women participated in the labor force. By 1998, nearly three of every five women of working age were in the labor force. Among women aged 16 and over, the labor force participation rate was 33.9% in 1950, compared with 59.8% in 1998. The Lady Wrestlers also came to prominence in a time when African Americans were relegated to low-paying menial jobs. Here's some sobering information from a vintage U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics study written by Mary S. Bedell entitled Employment and Income of Negro Workers, 1940 to 1952. Negro workers in terms of employment and income were less well off than white workers in 1952, although the comparison was more favorable than in 1940, according to the study. The improvement was due almost entirely to the fact that Negroes in shifting to non-agricultural industries were able to get better jobs and were therefore less heavily concentrated in the traditionally unskilled and low-wage occupations. Who knew that professional wrestling was one of the factors that contributed to African Americans being less heavily concentrated in the traditionally unskilled and low-wage occupations? That last statement was mine, of course, and was not part of the text of the study. <clears throat> Ahem, anyway, the study goes on to report that relatively fewer Negroes than whites who wanted to work could find jobs in 1952. Although percentage-wise, more Negroes were actually in the labor force. This was also true in 1940. The civilian labor force in 1952 totaled nearly 63 million, and included 56.9% of the white and 62.2% of the Negro population of working age. Virtually all of the difference was due to the fact that 44.2% of Negro women compared to 32.7% of white women were working or seeking work. To underscore how much ahead of their time the African-American lady wrestlers were, Here's more of my interview with Ohio State African-American Studies professor Hassan Jeffries. On the one hand, you have, you have African-Americans trying to break into or participate in a profession that's predominantly white, but then you have women trying to participate in a profession that's predominantly male and seen as male. Of course, once they became wrestlers in the 1950s, the African-American women not only had to fight to be taken seriously in what was considered a man's sport, they also had to battle the Jim Crow segregation that all African-Americans had to face at the time. Here's another clip from Hassan Jeffries talking about the segregated conditions that the black women wrestlers dealt with. The Klan gets too much credit uh, for being the, the principal perpetuator of racial violence. 
they just had to worry about white people, right? I mean, it wasn't the the, the person who you were concerned about wasn't uh, you know sort of a group of uh, of southern hayseeds, you know, who were drunk riding with hoods and might fall in behind you on a dark road. I mean, it was any white person who you happened to encounter, right? And they all they, they they didn't wear masks. They didn't need to wear masks because they had permission of society to do whatever the hell they wanted to do, uh, and especially for black women. Any encounter could lead uh, to uh, a sexual assault, uh, could lead to a physical assault, um, could lead to violence. And so that's towing that line. After a break, we'll hear from the lady wrestlers themselves about the second class citizen treatment that they endured. Black women wrestlers who integrated the business in the 1950s experienced a strange paradox. They traveled the world and gained international fame as superstars. But when they returned home, they were subjected to humiliating circumstances. Here's a clip from the documentary in which wrestling legend Ramona Isbell describes her encounters with Jim Crow. We had segregated um, dressing rooms and when we first started out and we had uh, restrooms where, you know, you drive along the highway and you have to eat. This is in the United States of America. You had to go into the kitchens, uh, go in the back door in the kitchen to get your food, or the guys would have to bring your food out to you because you weren't allowed to go into the restaurants. And here's another clip in which wrestling legend Ethel Johnson talks about her experiences with prejudice and discrimination. I remember where you walked down the sidewalk and if a white person was coming down the sidewalk, you had to get off the sidewalk and let them by if it was full, you know, you being blind. It was a lots of stuff that was so ungodly. It's surrounding your work. It made the work unbearable. Hearing these amazing women describe the indignities they endured is certainly painful. But unfortunately, it's not surprising, given the racial climate of the United States at the time. It's important to keep in mind that these women entered the wrestling business before many of the gains of the civil rights movement had been won. Jim Crow laws were a collection of state and local statutes that legalized racial segregation, according to History.com. Named after a Black minstrel show character, the laws, which existed for about 100 years from the post-Civil War era until about 1968, were meant to marginalize African Americans by denying them the right to vote hold jobs, get an education, or other opportunities. Those who attempted to defy Jim Crow laws often faced arrest, fines, jail sentences, violence, and death, the History.com article concludes. Given the hostile climate that the African-American lady wrestlers confronted, is it possible that they had any white allies the answer might surprise you. After another quick break, we'll hear about the support that Black women found in unlikely places. The term ally is very 21st century. There have always been white people who sympathized with and even participated in the ongoing struggle for social justice for African Americans but the term ally didn't become commonplace until fairly recently. One person who served as an unlikely ally to black women back in the day was legendary, or should I say notorious, wrestling promoter, Billy Wolf. Wolf is widely credited with ushering in the golden age of women's wrestling, which lasted from the 1930s through the 1950s. After Wolf married a young white woman named Mildred Burke, he groomed her into the first world women's wrestling champion. And then he set about recruiting scores of other women of all races to compete against his wife. Wolf had a reputation for womanizing and engaging in underhanded business practices, but he was surprisingly ahead of his time when it came to race relations. In this clip from the documentary, Washington Post reporter Jeff Lean, author of the acclaimed book, Queen of the Ring, a biography of Mildred Burke describes how Billy Wolf was inspired by how Jackie Robinson integrated Major League Baseball in 1947. Everything about his life 
was geared to make women's wrestling a success. And anything that could help that business, he was in favor of. Billy Wolf worked alongside another legendary wrestling promoter, Al Haft, in helping women's wrestling to gain credibility around the world. He had an arena called Haft's Acre, which uh, would fit 6,000 people. He had a gym called Haft's Gym on High Street. It was one of the top wrestling training gyms in the country. Women and men trained there. And uh, he was, he was um, uh, one of the founding uh, members of the National Wrestling Alliance. So he was a member of good standing of the most powerful monopoly. In addition to the promoters, black women wrestlers got a little help from their friends, as the Beatles song goes. Ethel Johnson and her sisters Babs Wingo and Marva Scott who were respected wrestlers in their own right, were befriended by a Caucasian wrestler who also happened to be named Ethel, Ethel Brown. In this clip from the documentary, Ethel Brown describes how she and the Black women respected each other as colleagues and banded together to help each other succeed in a business that was stacked in favor of men. The three of us would exercise together or work out together in the ring, try something new. In the documentary, Ethel Johnson talks about how when Martin Luther King and other civil rights leaders would come into town to do civil rights rallies, the women often had to forfeit their matches because the wrestling promoters didn't want to stage an event in which people of different races would be coming together while a civil rights demonstration was going on. And we kept on listening around until we hear them whispering about this, you know. And it was called a white citizen council. White citizen counselor was a form of the Ku Klux Klan, you know? Ethel Johnson in the documentary also talks about how she grew tired of doing two matches each time she wrestled, one for white audiences and one for black audiences, because many of the promoters, especially in the South, did not want to integrate the audiences. You often hear Motown performers talk about how early on in their careers, they performed in segregated audiences with whites on the floor and blacks in the balcony of the theaters where they performed. In this clip from the documentary, Ethel Johnson talks about how she took a stand and decided that she did not want to wrestle anymore in front of segregated audiences. So we decided that we wasn't gonna work, you know? So this girl and I that were there, we said, well, we getting in the car leaving. So what enabled these women to be so daring? One factor may have been their age. Many of the lady wrestlers got into the business in their teens and 20s. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, among women, the biggest increase in labor force participation was among those aged 25 to 34. Their rate more than doubled from a level of 34% in 1950 to 76.3% in 1998. Also in 1950, women aged 16 to 24 had the highest labor force participation rate, 43.9%. Here's another clip from the documentary in which Ethel Johnson talks about how she got into the wrestling business as a preteen. This was after school, I would go there and spend three hours in the gym, and that was, God, I must have been starting around 12. But most everybody else was adults, you know. So, except my sister, cause she was only 16 too. Ethel Johnson, along with her sisters, Babs and Marva, and many of their African-American female peers, went on to become wrestling superstars. On the next edition of Lady Wrestler, the story behind the story, I'll share backstage stories, exclusive, never before heard anecdotes about the making of the documentary. Like the time that I held a private screening for the lady wrestlers who were kind enough to be interviewed on camera and their families. Due to some technical glitches, the interview almost didn't happen. Hear the details of that hair raising incident and much more on the next edition of Lady Wrestler, the story behind the story. Please rate and review us on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. And be sure to catch the documentary on Amazon Prime Video. Thank you for listening. Catch you next time.